Good afternoon. I'm Eric Allen, and I am a faculty member with the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. And this is the last of our summer series, our advanced formation webinar series. So today we're going to be thinking about uh, Don Quixote. So let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. All right. And we'll just uh, we'll just go ahead and get started here. Okay, so let's uh, let's open up then in in a word of prayer, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us in the same spirit to savor what is right and to ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, so as you can see there, I've uh, titled or subtitled uh, this uh, talk today on, on Don Quixote as the recovery of near rationality. And uh, clearly, I'm making kind of a, a play on words there with rationality and, and narration. And why I'm doing that, I think, will become evident, hopefully become evident by the time we get to the end of the uh, talk today. But I also kind of like it because I think Cervantes would like it. Uh, he, he loved language, as we'll see later, loved word plays. Uh, so I think he would be pleased with that subtitle. So I want to begin with just a, a little biographical sketch of the life of Cervantes. And you see the image here. This is typically the image that comes up if you do a search for Miguel de Cervantes online, or a lot of biographies will have this uh, portrait on the cover of the book. But actually, we have no reliable image of Cervantes. We don't know for sure that this was him. We do know that he had a blonde beard. So this portrait has that much going for it. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at 16th century portraits of Spanish gentlemen, they've all got this collar on, they've all got the long, narrow face, the pointy beard, the mustache, the receding hairline. So you could almost take any portrait of a 16th century gentleman and put it on here, and it would probably look pretty close to what Miguel looked like. So uh, at any rate, um, you can see there uh, when he lived, he lived from about the middle of the 16th century to the early 17th century. Now Cervantes was born in the middle, pretty much right in the middle of Spain. And you'll have to forgive my Spanish pronunciation here because I don't know Spanish. But this little town right here called Alcala de Henares is his hometown. You can see it's very close to Madrid and just north of La Mancha, this flat hot plain here in uh, Spain, where he situates Don Quixote. And the later part of uh, Cervantes' life, he's going to live here in Esquivias, just south of his hometown. And you have a, an image there on the screen as well of what his hometown looks like today. So it, I've never been there, unfortunately, not yet. Hope to. Um, but it's a very picturesque uh, town, as you can see. Now, Cervantes was baptized, we know this from church records, on the 9th of October in 1547 in this church. This is Santa Maria la Mayor. So baptized October 9th. We don't know his exact birthday, although Michaelmas, uh, St. Michael's Day, was on, of course, September 29th. And Miguel is Spanish for Michael, so he was probably born on or about Michaelmas. But we don't know that for sure. And in fact, we know very little about the childhood and adolescence of Cervantes. What little we know um, is that his family moved around a lot. And his father was a barber surgeon. And you may recall that barber surgeons in the medieval and, and, and early modern period, uh, well, you, you could go to the same guy to get your hair cut or to get your arm amputated. So they were they were barber surgeons, the, the common denominator there, there being sharp instruments, right? Sounds really bizarre to us, but, but it was a thing. And uh, Cervantes' father apparently had a very, well, we know did have a very difficult time making a living. And 
the fact that he was uh, Rodrigo Cervantes' father was born deaf probably contributed to that uh, to a significant degree. But at any rate, we have little, uh, you know, kind of scraps of evidence in different parts of Spain where his father would lease a place or take out a loan or try to repay a loan or get an extension on, on some kind of loan. And so we have all these little clues in various towns of where at least his father lived. And we kind of assume that um, that Miguel and the other children may have been tagging along. So we know very little about, uh, about Miguel de Cervantes until he becomes a young adult. And then we see him emerging into adulthood as a well-educated, uh, very articulate uh, young man who wants to make a name for himself in literary circles. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later. If you were to ask Cervantes himself, the most important event of his life happened on 7 October, 1571. And this of course was the Battle of Lepanto when the Holy League, a, um, a, a fleet of ships from various countries, Spain and Naples, Sicily and others led by Don Juan of Austria met Ottoman forces in the Gulf of Lepanto off the Western coast of Greece. And uh, Cervantes was there. He was on board a ship named the Marquesa. And most scholars look back at the Battle of Lepanto and see it as a, a major turning point, if not militaristically, at least psychologically, in that, uh, that tension between the Turks and uh, Eastern Europe, and where the Turks were continually trying to, to, to push in to the Eastern boundary of Europe. And this uh, was quite a blow to the Ottoman Turks that they could be defeated in such a, a sound manner in this battle. But Cervantes was there, as I said, he was on board a ship. And when the day of battle came, Cervantes was actually uh, below deck and he was very sick. He had a really high fever and was in no condition to fight. But he went up on deck and went to his captain and said, I, I want to fight, I want to be in this fight. And his captain told him, nope, you're a sick man. Uh, you'll do everybody uh, the best by just going back below deck and trying to recover. And we know Cervantes' response because it was recorded by some other soldiers that were there when this interchange happened between him and his captain. And Cervantes responded to this effect. He said, up to now, I have served as a good soldier. I shall not do less on this occasion. It is better that I should fight in the service of God and the king and die for them than keep under cover. And so the captain, you know, in respect of his bravery and, 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 um, and courage said, okay, you're going to fight, go to the front of the ship, and, and that's your position. So Cervantes did fight, and he was shot three times, uh, twice in the chest and once in the left arm. And because particularly of the uh, the blow he took to the left arm, he lost the use of, of that arm. So he was uh, a one-armed man for the rest of his life. I mean, he still had his left arm, but it was, it was useless. But here's what Cervantes said about that day, about that experience. And he's speaking here in the third person of himself. Cervantes says he was a soldier for many years, where he learned to have patience in adversity. He lost his left hand from a harquebus shot during the naval battle at Lepanto. He considers his wound beautiful, though it is ugly looking, because he received it on the most memorable and exalted occasion that passing centuries have seen. Uh, quite the man Cervantes, and, and there's a lot more about his uh, biography that, that shows how noble he was. And, you know, maybe if you want, in, in the Q&A, we can look at some of that, but uh, but I think this is just very exemplary of the kind of man that he was. Now, in spite of that, he was a man who underwent a lot more affliction than just the wounds at Lepanto. Now, in, in the novel uh, Don Quixote, there's this wonderful scene where the uh, uh, Quixote's friends, the priest and the barber, are conducting an inquisition on the library of Don Quixote. So they're going through one book at a time and determining whether or not it, it's okay to keep it in the library or whether they should toss it out the window in the pile to go to the bonfire. And while they're going through uh, Quixote's books, they come across a work, La Galatea, 
which was authored by Miguel de Cervantes. And this, this is so classic of, of Cervantes, where he, he writes himself into the story. So he's writing the story about Don Quixote. They find a book in the library that is written by him, right? And then the priest says this about Cervantes. He says that Cervantes has had more experience in reverses than in verses. And that's, that's so true. Uh, and, and what he's saying there is, is that uh, Cervantes has far more experience in troubles and afflictions than he does in actually composing poems or, 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 or plays or novels. And so just to, to quickly go through some of the more notable reverses that Cervantes had. So after he spent some time in infirmary, recovering from his wounds at Lepanto, he was on a ship on his way back to Spain, and the ship was taken captive by Barbary pirates. And all the members were taken, cap uh, taken captive to Algeria and North Africa, and, uh, and Cervantes was among them. So, uh, I mean, what, what rotten luck, right? And he spent five years in captivity in Northern Africa, in Algeria. During that time, Cervantes led four escape attempts, which ended up in four recaptures. And it does appear that he did lead these escapes, that he wasn't just depending on someone else to do it, but he took the initiative to try and escape. Uh, but every, every time they failed. And there's interesting stories that go along with uh, some of those failures as well. Eventually, he was ransomed from captivity and able to return to Spain. And he married a young woman, uh, Catalina. And I say a young woman because she really was. He was, uh, Cervantes was 37 and Catalina was 19 at the time that they married. And Cervantes um, thought he was marrying into money. In fact, Catalina probably thought she had more money than she did. But it became apparent pretty soon that uh, that Cervantes was going to have to work for a living and not just be able to live off of the wealth <clears throat> of the family that he married into. So within a couple of years uh, after being married, Cervantes took an appointment as a commissary to help equip the Spanish Armada to fight the English. And Cervantes' job was to go throughout Spain and to acquire wheat and, um, and oil to be part of the supplies to go on the ships for the Armada. Now, we all know how the Spanish Armada, how that ended up and what a fiasco that was. Well, pretty much Cervantes' experience as a commissary uh, was also a fiasco. And this whole system of trying to uh, requisition grain and, and oil for the, the Spanish Armada was, it was just uh, such a bad system that it really lent itself very well to, uh, to corruption and to legal and financial troubles. And Cervantes found himself just mired in, in the muck of that, uh, including he got excommunicated twice. <laughs> and um, I mean, I'm laughing, poor guy, but um, I mean, it just, it just never seemed to work out for him. And, and his excommunications had nothing to do with um, uh, uh, morality or, or, or doctrine. It was really more local politics. So Cervantes had such great luck working for the government, right? I mean, he was a soldier on board a ship where he got shot three times, and then he got captured by pirates, and then he was this commissary, ended up getting excommunicated. So things had gone so well for him working for the government that he figured he would try it one more time. And so he, uh, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada and that position went away, uh, Cervantes accepted a position working for the crown to retrieve unpaid back taxes. Now, you can imagine that being a tax collector in 16th century Spain is probably not the most enviable position. But here he was not just collecting taxes, but collecting taxes from people that had already demonstrated they had no intention of paying them, right? And this system as well was just rife for corruption and for backbiting and for betrayal. And it didn't help that Cervantes, uh, even though he was uh, a, a man of utmost integrity, he was a poor bookkeeper, and we still have some of those records, and scholars have gone through them and, 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 and seen places where he made uh, some pretty significant bookkeeping errors. Well, between the corruption and his bookkeeping errors, he got himself in trouble again and actually spent uh, a couple of months in the notorious prison of Seville. Now, in all this legal trouble, 
uh, Cervantes uh, was always exonerated. You know, he got legal help and uh, these things went to trial and he was always exonerated of uh, his wrongdoing, but still he had to go through all that. In spite of all that, somewhere in the middle of all this, he begins writing Don Quixote. And so I wanna shift now to, to look at the novel, the story itself. Now, just to remind you, in case uh, it's been a while since you read the book, or maybe you've never actually read it, uh, the character Don Quixote is a gentleman. He's what's called a Hidalgo, which is the lowest level gentry in uh, 17th, uh, 16th and 17th century Spain. And Quixote was an avid reader of chivalric romance. So we're talking about things like um, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, right? Amadis of Gaul is one of his fav favorite uh, chivalric figures that he talks about. And so he reads just everything, all this chivalric literature. And the problem is that somewhere along the lines, he begins believing that it's true. <laughs> he begins thinking that all these knights really did live and they really did all these extraordinary things, uh, fighting giants and, and rescuing damsels in distress and and, and just all these exotic adventures. He thinks it's true history. Now, meanwhile, uh, as uh, what's going on in Spain, both the Spain of Cervantes and the Spain of Quixote, is that Spain is really in a lot of ways in decline. It's in decline, particularly morally. And, and, and Quixote thinks that Spain has, has lost its, its heritage of honor, its heritage of virtue. And Quixote wants to restore that to Spain through chivalry, through what he calls knight errantry. Errantry there being a wandering knight, a, a knight wandering around, having these adventures and helping the helpless, right? So he sets out on this mission to do just that. And, and, and so uh, Quixote's deep-seated conviction that everything he's read in these chivalric romances, that everything is true, leads him to mistake ordinary events as exotic experiences. He begins to interpret everything as, as if it were part of some extraordinary chivalric adventure. So the most famous, of course, uh, is the windmill episode, right? Where he thinks the windmills are giants and he goes to attack them with uh, riding his uh, faithful steed, Rosinante, and it does not go very well, right? They get caught in one of the arms of the windmill and and tossed to the ground and, and you know, uh, just almost killed by the whole thing. But there's just through the, the whole um, book is full of these kind of things. So he sees flocks of sheep that are meeting in, in the middle of a road and he thinks that they're armies that are getting ready to battle. He meets prostitutes and he thinks that they're high born noble ladies. He sees a roadside inn and he thinks it's a castle. And then one of my favorite episodes, um, if, if you can find a favorite episode, it's so hard, there's so many good ones. But one of my favorite is in the second uh, part of the novel, which we'll talk about that division here in a minute. But in the second part of the novel, uh, Quixote is watching a puppet show. And he starts out very much aware that it's a puppet show. But somewhere in the middle of it, he, he, he loses himself and thinks it's real and, and inserts himself into the puppet show. And I won't spoil the ending of that for you. It's, it's so, so funny. You've got to read it for yourself if, if you haven't. Now, if you and I were to charge a windmill and to get thrown to the ground and, and barely escape with our lives, we would probably recollect uh, uh, ourselves and, and think, okay, something's wrong here, right? I've made a gross misinterpretation. That was not a giant. That was a windmill. I need to I need to back up and, and rethink the way I'm perceiving reality. But Quixote never does that. And in fact, any evidence to the contrary, he attributes to the work of enchanters. Now, sometimes enchanters are on his side and help him out. But most of the time, uh, when, particularly when there's anything that goes awry, he says it's enchanters. So when he sees these flocks of sheep coming to do battle and he enters in and starts you know, killing sheep right and left because he thinks he's killing enemies. And then the, uh, the shepherds are pelting him with rocks and, and leave him for dead. Uh, Quixote doesn't realize, wow, I made a big mistake here. Those were not armies, those were sheep. Instead he says, ah, oh, those enchanters, they did it again, right? Um, they, they turned 
these armies into sheep just to rob me of the opportunity for honor. So uh, this is a really important part of the story that he has in this built-in mechanism, right, to keep his delusion alive. Well, let's think, uh, uh, look for a minute just at the, the, the composition of uh, Don Quixote, and then I want us to look at a couple of episodes in the book. So you can see here from the, the slide that uh, the book is really divided into part one and part two, or volume one and volume two. And the first part was published in 1605. It became an immediate success and began to be translated in other languages throughout Europe, uh, even into English in uh, 1612 was translated into English. It was a huge uh, success overseas as well in the Spanish colonies, particularly in Peru. Uh, Don Quixote was much loved in Peru, which is kind of odd for us to think about today, but you know, remembering that there were uh, flourishing Spanish colonies there, it, it kind of makes sense. And then what happened is that, that part one, or volume one, however you want to say it, uh, was such a success that there began to be imitators others that were wanting to capitalize on the success of Don Quixote. And in particular, there was a, a false uh, sequel that was written. And all we know about the author is his pen name. His pen name was Alonso Fernandez de Avellaneda. And what this, uh, this author did was to write a sequel to part one. Because at the end of part one, Cervantes left Quixote alive. And it just was kind of begging for a sequel, right? And so this um, uh, Avellaneda fella, whoever he really was, wrote a sequel, and it began to get some popularity. And understandably, this made Cervantes very unhappy that someone else out there is capitalizing on his own work and making some money off of it and, and gaining you know, uh, fame and popularity uh, at the expense of Cervantes you know, uh, himself. So. Miguel de Cervantes decided to write a part two, and he decided to write a volume two that would end with the death of Quixote so that no one could ever write a further sequel. Now, one of the really funny things about this is that when you begin reading part two, Quixote himself, the character Quixote, right, is aware of the false sequel that was written by Avellaneda. And he's mad about it because it tells stories about him that aren't true, right? Well, of course, nothing's true. But, you know, it, it, this is Cervantes, right? Mixing reality with fiction all the time. And, and, and it, it's so uh, fun the way he does it. And then when Quixote shows up in different places in volume two, the other people, the characters in the story, recognize him. As soon as they figure out who he is, they, they know all about him from the part one that Cervantes wrote. And then some of them also know part two. And so there's all this interaction going on in volume two between Quixote and other characters um, where there's this shared knowledge about the first part of Don Quixote and sometimes about this, the false uh, sequel. So it's, it's really, uh, really fun to see how he does that. Now, part one and part two have some significant differences. Part one is primarily uh, the action primarily takes place in rural settings. Most of the characters are, are rogues, kind of low lifes, you know, gypsies and mule drivers, prostitutes, shepherds. And in part one, Don Quixote creates almost all of his own trouble. He creates his own trouble through his delusion, through things like the windmill, right? Uh, all these misadventures, all these adventures that go badly because he's misinterpreted reality and they backfire and he ends up you know, suffering the wrath of whoever he's been trying to save or whoever he's been trying to conquer. So he creates his own trouble in part one. In part two, instead of rural settings, most of the settings are urban. Uh, in fact, most of the action either takes place in a, in, uh, well, we wouldn't really say an urban setting, but a, a country estate or in a castle. And then as he's traveling around, he's not traveling around the countryside, he's traveling through cities, right? And most of the characters that he interacts with, not exclusively, but most of the characters that Quixote interacts with in part two are nobility, aristocrats. So he interacts uh, quite a bit uh, with a duke and a duchess. 
And they recognize him from having read uh, the first part of Don Quixote. And this is really the, the biggest difference between part one and part two is that here the characters play jokes on Don Quixote because they already know what he's like from having read part one. So the Duke and the Duchess, for example, create these elaborate schemes really just to mock Don Quixote and to get a laugh out of him, uh, to make fun of him, to see what they can get by with. So, you know, pretty significant differences there between part one and part two. And, and we'll come back to that at the end as we think about how to interpret and, uh, and kind of negotiate what's going on in the story. Well, I want to uh, just take a few minutes and actually read, uh, not gonna read the whole chapter, but just read a part of a chapter out of uh, part two, volume two of Don Quixote. And this is the episode of the Enchanted Boat. And so just, um, just kind of sit back and enjoy it for the next few minutes. Uh, how can you not enjoy hearing Don Quixote, uh, the story, right? So at an unhurried and leisurely pace, two days after they left the stand of trees, Don Quixote and Sancho came to the Ebro River and seeing it brought great joy to Don Quixote because he contemplated and observed the pleasantness of its banks, the clarity of its waters, the gentleness of its current, and the abundance of its liquid crystal. And this happy sight revived in his memory a thousand amorous thoughts. As they proceeded in this fashion, that is, Quixote and his squire, Sancho Panza, there came into view a small boat that lacked oars or any other kind of gear and was pulled up to shore and tied to the trunk of a tree on the riverbank. Don Quixote looked all around and saw no one. And then, without warning, he dismounted Rocinante and told Sancho to do the same with his donkey and to tie both animals very carefully to the trunk of a poplar or willow that was growing there. Sancho asked the reason for this sudden dismounting and tethering of their animals. Don Quixote responded, you must know, Sancho, that this boat clearly and beyond any doubt is calling and inviting me to get in it and sail to assist a knight or some other eminent person in need who must be in grave danger. Because in the books of chivalric histories, this is what is done by the enchanters who become involved and act in them. When a knight is placed in extreme difficulty and cannot be freed except by the hand of another knight, though the second knight may be at a distance of two or three thousand leagues or even more. Either they carry him off on a cloud or provide him with a boat which he enters. And in the blink of an eye, they move him through the air or over the sea, wherever they wish and wherever his help is needed. And so, O oh Sancho, this boat has been placed here for the very same purpose. And this is as true as the fact that it is now day. And before this day is over, tie the donkey and Rosanante together, and may the hand of God guide us, for I would not fail to embark, even if asked not to by discalced friars. Well, if that's true, responded Sancho, and your grace at every step insists on finding nonsensical things or whatever you call them, there's nothing I can do but obey and bow my head and follow the proverb that says, do what your master tells you and sit with him at the table. But just to satisfy my conscience, I want to warn your grace that I don't think this boat is one of the enchanted ones. It seems to me it belongs to some fishermen because the best shad in the world swim this river. And then Don Quixote, go ahead and get in the boat and, and have a little bit of conversation. And Quixote thinks that they have made it to the ocean. And Quixote says to Sancho, we must have emerged already and traveled at least 700 or 800 leagues. And if I had an astrolabe here and could calculate the height of the pole, I could tell you how far we have traveled. Although earlier I knew very little, or we have already passed or will soon pass. Oh, sorry, although either I know very little, or we have already passed or will soon pass, the equinoctial line that divides and separates the opposite poles at an equal distance from each. I don't believe any of that, responded Sancho. But even so, I'll do what your grace tells me to, though I can see with my own eyes that we haven't gone five varas from shore, and we haven't moved two varas away from the animals, because there's Rosinanti and the donkey, exactly where we left them. And looking carefully, which is what I'm doing now, I swear that we're not even moving. 
or traveling as fast as an ant. At this point, they saw two large water mills in the middle of the river. And as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said in a loud voice to Sancho, do you see there, my friend, you can see the city, the castle or fortress where some knight is being held captive or some queen, princess or noblewoman ill-treated. And I have been brought here to deliver them. What the devil kind of city, fortress or castle is your grace talking about, senor, said Sancho. Can't you see that those are water mills in the river where they grind wheat? Be quiet, Sancho, said Don Quixote. For although they seem to be water mills, they are not. I have already told you that enchantments change and alter all things from their natural state. I do not mean to say that they are all or that they are really altered from one state to another, but that they seem to be, as experience has shown in the transformation of Dulcinea, sole refuge of my hopes. And then the boat, having entered the middle of the current, began to travel not quite so slowly as it had so far. Many of the millers in the water mills who saw that the boat was coming down the river and would be swallowed up by the rushing torrent of the wheels hurried out with long poles to stop it. And since they came out well flowered, their faces and clothes covered in dust from the flower, they were not a pretty sight. They were shouting, saying, you devils, where are you going? Are you crazy? Do you want to drown and be smashed to pieces by those wheels? Did I not tell you, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that we had come to a place where I would show the valor of my arm? Look at the miscreants and scoundrels who have come out to meet me. Look at the number of monsters who oppose me. Look at their hideous faces grimacing at us. Well, now you will see, you villains. And standing up in the boat with great shouts, he began to threaten the millers, saying, Wicked and ill-advised rabble, set free and release the person, high-born or low, no matter his estate or quality, whom you hold captive in your fortress or prison, for I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, also known as the Knight of the Lions, for whom, by order of the heavens on high, the successful conclusion of this adventure has been reserved. And saying this, he put his hand on his sword and began to flourish it in the air against the millers, who, hearing but not understanding this nonsense, began to use their poles to stop the boat, which by now was entering the mill race rapids. Sancho was on his knees, devoutly praying to heaven to save him from so clear a danger, which it did through the efforts and speed of the millers who pushed against the boat with their poles and stopped it, but could not keep it from capsizing and throwing Don Quixote and Sancho into the water. It was fortunate for Don Quixote that he knew how to swim like a goose, although the weight of his armor made him sink twice. And if it had not been for the millers who jumped into the water and pulled them out, it would have been the end of them both. When they had been pulled to land, more soaked than dying of thirst, Sancho, on his knees, hands clasped, eyes turned up to heaven, asked God in a long and devout prayer to save him from any future rash desires and acts of his master. Then the fisherman arrived who owned the boat, which had been shattered by the wheels of the water mills, and seeing that it had been smashed to pieces, they began to strip Sancho and to demand that Don Quixote pay them. And he, very calmly, as if nothing had happened, told the millers and fishermen he would gladly pay for the boat on the condition that they willingly and without reservation turn over to him the person or persons whom they were holding captive in their castle. Are you out of your mind? What persons or what castle are you talking about? Responded one of the millers. Do you want to take the people who come to grind wheat at these mills? Enough, Don Quixote said to himself. It will be preaching in the desert to try to convince this rabble to take any virtuous action. In this adventure, two valiant enchanters must have had an encounter, and one hinders what the other attempts. One provided me with a boat, and the other threw me out of it. God help us, for the entire world is nothing but tricks and deceptions opposing one another. I can do no more. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that little um, episode there. Even if you've heard it again, I've, I've read this a dozen times at least, and uh, I get a kick out of it every time. And I also wanted to share that one because you can see it's, um, it's pretty far into the book. It's about halfway through volume two. And in my experience, most people who set out to read Don Quixote uh, don't even make it through volume one. So I just wanted to whet your appetite that there's a lot of good stuff uh, continuing throughout the whole book. Uh, so there they are heading towards the water wheel. I forgot to forward it there a little bit at that point. 
All right, so it doesn't take very long in uh, the book before you're going to realize that this is a story about language. It's a story about words. It's a story about stories. It's a story, as, as I've already mentioned, about the intersection of reality and story. And, and the way I like to think about it, it's a story about the storied nature of reality. Now, when I was preparing this talk for today, uh, I sort of set out on my own quixotic adventure because I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to go through uh, the entire book and I was going to keep a log. I even had like this little spreadsheet set up. I was all ready for it. I was going to keep a record uh, of all the places in the book where there's a literary illusion or some kind of uh, reference to genres of literature or what have you, just to, to show you how deeply interested in the use of language Cervantes is. Well, it was, it was a quixotic adventure. It was doomed to failure uh, because I didn't get through the first page or two before I realized it, it was an impossible task because the entire book it's just illusion after illusion and reference after reference and wordplay after wordplay. I mean, it really is the whole novel. There, there are innumerable references to historical and fictional works of prose, poetry, sonnets, acronyms, proverbs, allusions, quotations, philosophy, sermons, scriptures, songs, stage plays, personal letters, legal documents, inscriptions, autobiographies, biographies, etymologies, words carved in trees, and even, to cap it all off, a tour of a print shop. Of course, how could you have a book about language without a tour of a print shop, right? Uh, about the only type of writing that is missing in the novel is a tattoo. And I can only imagine that's because Cervantes never saw a tattoo that was created with words or letters. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have found a way to put it in there. Now, there are dozens of examples of this. Um, I mean, as I said, the whole novel really is just, that's what the novel is. But I want to give you one example to, to give you a sense of how uh, Cervantes does this. So there's an episode in the first part of the novel, in part one, where Don Quixote has had some misadventure and he's gone back to the inn and he's up in the loft sleeping off, you know, the, the, the pain and injuries that he's experienced. And everybody else, uh, his squire and his friends and, and, and new acquaintances are all downstairs, just kind of hanging out. And it comes to light that an unknown guest has left a briefcase of books in the inn. All right, this is a clue, right? Cervantes is about to do something really cool because he loves language, he loves literature. So he's writing a novel about Don Quixote. And now we've got a briefcase of books. So books within the book, right? Well, what do you think happens? Of course. They open up the briefcase and they take out the books. And as they're removing the books, some loose papers fall out of one of the books. So they pick up the papers and what do you know? An unknown author has written a novel on the loose papers. So you can see how Cervantes is already entangling and embedding us in all these layers of, of fictionality and literary sort of things, right? We're reading a novel and there's a briefcase of books we take out the books and there's papers and on the papers is a novel. So one of Don Quixote's friends, the priest, decides he's gonna read the story uh, for everyone's enjoyment. And so he does that. And the story is called the uh, story of the man who is recklessly curious. And it goes by different translations or different titles and different translations, but that's, that, that one works. And it's a story about a man named Anselmo who has a new bride named Camilla. And Anselmo convinces his best friend, Laterio, to try and seduce Camilla. Now you think, why in the world would he do that? Well, he, he wants Laterio to try and seduce Camilla because he wants to test Camilla's virtue, to see if she's really as virtuous as he thinks that she is. Now, that sounds like a bizarre um, kind of premise for a story, but it's, it's actually kind of a common motif or trope. Uh, uh, Chaucer has a very similar story in his Canterbury Tales. Anyway, back to Quixote. So as the story begins, Anselmo leaves home, and he does that purposely so that Laterio has some freedom to try and seduce Camilla. But after Anselmo leaves home, Camilla writes letters to him, right? So we're getting all this literary stuff. Think about the literary things going on. And then Anselmo writes letters back to Camilla. And of course, we have access to reading these letters, particularly the ones that Camilla wrote. 
And then Laterio writes sonnets to try and seduce Camilla. And, and, and as all this action and dialogue uh, is going on, the story and the letters and the sonnets and, the, and all the language is full of real, um, of literary references to real and fictional works. There are references to Ovid's Metamorphoses, to scripture, to the, uh, the story of Lucretia and Tarquinius, to Brutus and Portia, as well as references to fictional poets and, and even a fictional stage play that shows up in the middle of this story. So I mean, think about where we are now, right? We're in not Don Quixote, but we've, we've got a box of books or a briefcase of books. We've taken out the books. We're reading a story that was on some papers and in the story are all these, oh, it just goes on and on, right? With all these layers. Well, eventually, uh, Laterio's power of language seduces Camilla uh, successfully. And they have this uh, torrid affair right underneath on Selmo's nose. He has no idea. And meanwhile, while this plot is working itself out within this story, there's a subplot about Camilla's housemaid who is having her own affair, right? Now, Anselmo eventually realizes that his plan has backfired and that he's lost both his wife and his best friend. And so it all kind of blows up and uh, Laterio and Camilla take off and Anselmo decides to write his autobiography to recount his tragic life. And he's in the middle of writing his autobiography and he dies and he's found with a pen in his hand. And uh, Laterio ends up being killed in battle and Camilla uh, enters a convent. And, and so Cervantes just masterfully, right, has just tangled us up in this labyrinth and all these layers of, of story upon story and subplot and, and, and plays and poems and sonnets. But you never feel lost. That's what's, that's what's amazing. Cervantes is such a good storyteller that he can weave all these things together that you, you never realize how deep uh, into the cave you have gone until the very end when he brings you back out and you find yourself back in the inn with the priest finishing up the story and uh, Coyote up in the, in the, uh, uh, the loft uh, having his own little new adventure. And so it's just, it's beautiful and it's such a great uh, example of the way Cervantes loves to use language. Well, I wanna kind of back away now for the next little bit here as we wrap up in the next few slides and kind of look at the book as a whole. And what is it that Cervantes is doing in the book? So that as you read the book, hopefully this will help you negotiate it. Uh, and particularly as you teach the book, uh, you'll kind of have an eye for the sort of things to, um, to help your, your, your students discover. So I wanna look first of all at the power of language in Don Quixote. And there's at least six, I think, ways that Cervantes is exploring the power of language. And the first of these is the most obvious, and that is the power of language to deceive, right? Because Quixote himself has been deceived by reading these chivalric romances. It's the power of storytelling that has captured his imagination and, and, and uh, ruined his perspective, right, uh, of reality. The second is the power of language to engender romantic love. And the, the novel is full of all these love stories, uh, most of them uh, containing broken hearts. And the, the power of physical beauty, particularly the physical beauty of a young woman, to uh, capture the heart of a young man uh, is, you might say, more prominent than the power of romantic language. But as soon as the man is smitten, what, what do all these um, love smitten men do in the novel? Well, they all begin writing love letters and they begin writing songs and begin writing poetry, right? And it's just, just this effusion of, of, of romantic language that pours out of them. And, and Cervantes really just uh, explores this to the fullest. And kind of along with that, and this is maybe not a separate point, but maybe a sub point to that one, is the power of language to express deeply felt emotions, and particularly the emotion of sorrow. And, and you can think about, you know, we talked about the reverses that Cervantes had in his own life. I mean, five years in captivity in, uh, in Algeria, right? Not knowing if he would ever make it out. Uh, so desperate that he tries to escape four times. So, so Cervantes had a lot of experience thinking through his sorrow and how to express it and how to work through it linguistically. 
And, and so this is something that you're going to see quite a bit in the novel. Now, maybe surprisingly, and something that's not usually um, maybe thought of when, when people reflect on Don Quixote, <clears throat> is the power of language to clearly and convincingly express rational thought. You may think that's the last thing you're going to find in the novel. But one of the things that surprises uh, both us as readers and the characters within the story is Don Quixote so frequently sitting down and having these rational, clear-headed conversations about all kinds of subjects and making very powerful, um, well-ordered arguments that, uh, that, that evidence how intelligent he is and his power to harness language to make an argument. <clears throat> now, why that's so surprising is because he talks that way all the time, unless it has something to do with chivalry. And then he kind of just goes into his, his fantasy world. Another example of the power of language in uh, the novel is the, the power of language to govern and uh, judge well. And this is a minor part, I'll grant that, but there, there's a pretty significant series of chapters and episodes in part two where um, Sancho Panza is given the opportunity to rule, to, to be a governor and to govern what he thinks is an insula. And it's, it's got a lot of backstory to it and it's very, very funny. But Quixote spends a couple of chapters giving him a lot of advice about how to govern and rule well. And then Sancho Panza himself takes that advice in the following chapters and applies it and, and makes such wise decisions as a governor that he's referred to as a second Solomon. And, and so this, even though it's a, in terms of number of pages and content, it's a small part of the novel, it's a very important part of the novel. And I think it also plays into what's going on uh, socially and politically in the time of Cervantes. And then finally, um, uh, and mostly, is the power of language to bring pleasure to readers and to listeners. Now, Cervantes clearly loved good conversation. He loved good stories. He loved beautiful poetry. And I wish I could find the quotation. I lost it in my research and, and tried to chase it down and could not find it. But it was to the effect of this, that, that Cervantes said that the reason he wrote was so that those who were unhappy would become happy, and those who were already happy would become happier. And, that's, I, I, and that is so much in the spirit of, of this man, uh, that he, he really loved people, and he, he loved being with them, and he loved making them happy through story. Now, the one potency that language lacks in the book is the power to undo Quixote's madness. And if you read the novel, you know that several people try to talk him out of it, right? Sancho Panza, in the episode we read, is continually saying, I don't see what you see. I think you're out of your mind, right? Um, so language lacks the power in the novel to undo Quixote's madness. And we'll look in a minute at, at what it is that actually does undo his madness. But, but uh, Quixote's response was basically always, I'm right, and if you disagree with me, then you're deceived. Now, Don Quixote's mission fails, right? He clearly does not restore knight errantry. He does not restore chivalry to Spain. And he hardly has a successful mission anywhere. And I just want to uh, propose three reasons why Quixote's mission fail, fails. And I think this helps us discover why uh, the, the book is timeless, but it's, always it's also timely. And I think this can help us understand or, or see some of what makes this book so timely. So why does this mission fail? Well, the first is that it depends on a false narrative about history. That false narrative being that all these chivalric tales were true, that there really were you know, all these knights doing these heroic things. The second reason it fails is because it depends on a false assumption about reality. Quixote's false assumption is that reality conforms to our words rather than our words conforming to reality, right? He, he, he thinks because he, he declares that this is a windmill that, or, or sorry, that it's a giant, that the windmill actually is a giant. 
he thinks because you know he sees this and says that well those are those are soldiers down there and those are armies instead of flocks of sheep that it is so he thinks that because he declares himself a knight errant and Sancho Panza this peasant declares him a squire that it is so and, and so um, he, he he gets it backwards thinking that reality is going to conform to his language rather than seeing that he needs to conform his language to reality. And then finally, it fails because his mission depends on the demand. And, and you know, if you've read the book, that he often very strongly demands that everyone else accept his false narrative as true, his false assumptions about reality as true. I mean, to the point that if you disagree, you might be on the receiving end of his sword or of his lance. And so volume one is really about how this is impossible, right? He keeps running up against reality. Volume two is about what happens when everyone pretends your false narrative is true. It doesn't actually make things better. You just become the butt end of a joke. So I think these reasons and, and probably others you can think of um, are reasons that his mission fails. Okay, just gonna wrap it up here. And I wanna wrap it up with the last words of Don Quixote and of Cervantes. And uh, let me just read a very short section. Um, promise it's not as long as the last one. This is from the very end of the book. And don't worry if you've not read the end because um, the, the, the delight of Don Quixote is not that you have some kind of surprise ending. Um, the delight of Don Quixote is in the reading and experience of reading the book itself. So even though you might say it's a spoiler, it's really not going to spoil anything for you. So Quixote has returned home to uh, his house in La Mancha. He's had a, a really bad misadventure, um, which you can read about on your own. And he's not doing well. He's not feeling well. So his friends called the physician who took his pulse and did not give them good news and said there was no doubt that he should attend to the health of his soul because the health of his body was in peril. Don Quixote heard him with a tranquil spirit, but not his housekeeper, his niece, and his squire, who began to weep piteously, as if he were already lying dead before them. It was the physician's opinion that melancholy and low spirits were bringing his life to an end. Don Quixote asked to be left alone because he wanted to sleep for a while. They did as he asked, and he slept more than six hours at a stretch, as they say, so long that his housekeeper and niece thought he would never open his eyes again. He awoke after the length of time that has been mentioned, and giving a great shout, he said, Blessed be Almighty God, who has done such great, great good for me. His mercies have no limit, and the sins of men do not curtail or hinder them. His niece listened carefully to her uncle's words, and they seemed more sensible than the ones he usually said, at least during his illness. And she asked him, what is your grace saying, senor? Is there news? Which mercies are these and which sins of men? The mercies, niece, responded Don Quixote, are those that God has shown to me at this very instant. And as I said, my sins do not hinder them. My judgment is restored, free and clear of the dark shadows of ignorance imposed on it by my grievous and constant reading of detestable books of chivalry. I now recognize their absurdities and deceptions, and my sole regret is that this realization has come so late. It does not leave me time to compensate by reading other books that can be a light to the soul. I feel, niece, that I'm about to die. I should like to do so in a manner that would make it clear my life was not so wicked that I left behind a reputation for being a madman. For although I have been one, I should not like to confirm this truth in my death. Dear girl, call my friends for me, the priest, the bachelor Sanson Carrasco, and the barber Master Nicholas, for I wish to confess and make my will. Now, you may recall that the subtitle for this presentation was the, the restoration or the, the recovery of near rationality, right? And, and so Don Quixote, the reason I call it this, because Don Quixote only returned to his right mind once he realized what story he was really in, that he wasn't in the story of, of Knights Errant, but is he, in the, he was in the story of God's redemption, the story that God writes for each of us, that begins with the sacrament of baptism and concludes with the last rites, 
the story that, that weaves charity toward neighbor and love of friends and family into every chapter. And, and, I, and I think Cervantes would have us conclude that to live in any other story is madness. Now, as for Cervantes, Cervantes became a third order Franciscan in the last few years of his life. And as we consider his own last words, I think we'll be able to see that he too was in the right story. Three days before Cervantes died, he wrote this, my life is ending and it will finish its course this Sunday at the latest. And I shall finish the race of life. Farewell witticisms, farewell jests, farewell cheerful friends, for I am dying and anxious to see you again soon. Happy in the next life. Okay, there you go. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you enjoyed um, that little tour of the life of Cervantes and, and Don Quixote. So um, can open it up now, Maria, if you have you know, questions or comments or uh, any thoughts you want to share, I'll let me uh, stop sharing here. If I can figure out how to do that. There we go. I think I'm not sharing now. Uh, no, no questions. Just thank you. I'm excited to read it. I haven't read the book, so I've tried several times, but uh -huh. I'm hoping to persevere this time. Well, good. Well, that was that was one reason I kind of wanted to to give some excerpts from the second part there to help you see that it's 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 worth doing it. Um, I would, you know, one of the this last time when I read it uh, in preparation for this presentation today, what I did was actually listen to the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And I really recommend that, particularly if you get the audible version and uh, the, the, narr the voice narrator on there does all the different characters so well and so consistently. And it's a long listen. I think it's 40 hours to listen to the whole book, um, but you can do it at your leisure. And um, it's, it's a great way to experience the book or maybe combine it with reading and listening. I don't know. But uh, anyway, that might help you get through the whole book if if you listen to it instead of trying to just read it uh, yourself. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So any any other thoughts or um, anything? You yeah, want to I guess about? I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that, you know, the book kind of concluded with, you know, the story of salvation, like we enter into it um, because I never made it that far. So I think that gives me a lot of something to look forward to in the reading. It's like mm -hmm. that to pick up on those ideas and then that's coming at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it helps us see that that Cervantes wanted, I mean, he definitely wanted to tell an enjoyable story. And I think that was, you know, the prime thing that motivated him. But but he was a he was a very devout Catholic. And and I I think he realized he couldn't end the book without restoring um uh, Quixote to sanity, and that, that the means of that restoration was uh, a, a, a return to the sacraments, right? Mm. A re return to his faith. So. Okay, well, if nothing else, thank you for uh, uh, coming today and, and listening and, um, and giving your input. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you so much. You bet. All right. God bless.